All right, and we're live. Welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today is going to be Tactical Podcast number three. We're coming to you today with Dr. Sherman House. Dr. House is a dentist. He's a reserve police officer, a forensic odontologist, which he was explaining to me is um, basically identifying human remains by their teeth, which is a fascinating field, and we will get into that. And uh, he is a BJJ student, among a lot of other things. He is a kind of very multifaceted renaissance, renaissance type man. Um, you recently did Dr. House on James Yeager's channel, a C, kind of eight hours talking all about emergency medical care and stuff like that, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was um, eight, not eight hours total, but we did uh, four hours on trauma stuff. And then we did um, another four hours that was split between um, management of dental emergencies and then um, wound management. Outstanding, man. You know, I, there is kind of a focus in the tactical community right now on medical care, but not enough, to be honest with you, um, especially yeah. when it comes to emergency dental care. Sure. Now, we find ourselves in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic here, and um, I don't know because I haven't needed to find out, knock on wood, um, if dental offices are still operating or not. How about in your neck of the woods? Um, no, they were shut down here by the state, um, along with all other elective procedures. Um, the only thing that dentists are allowed to do right now is uh, management of emergencies, essentially. Wow. So, okay. so all the more reason for guys and girls at home to kind of know a thing or two about emergency dental care. Yeah, and, and you know, my big crux of... Um, you know, I mean, I could show people like, you know, how to put in temporary fillings and like what signs and symptoms of infections and stuff to watch for. But, you know, the big take home is to just not get yourself into that mess in the first place. And, you know, you do that through pre preventative care, you know, um, just like, uh, you, you know, when I used to teach these classes before all this stuff happened, um, people used to think it was kind of crazy because, you know, it was a lot of people that were like mountaineers. Um, we're students and, and, you know, a lot of medical missionary folks, you know, that travel um, and, and do that type of stuff um, and do adventure medicine, things like that. Um, and, you know, those people routinely get the idea that, like, if you're going to go travel to a place that is, you know, geographically inaccessible or in the third world, that you get your wisdom teeth taken out beforehand, that, you may you maybe get your appendix taken out before you go, you know, like things like this, just so that when you're there and you've got, you know, all these other odds essentially stacked up against you, you're not going to find yourself um, willingly in a scenario where you, um, that could have been avoided essentially wow. just by good preventative care. That's a great idea. Um, <clears throat> so can you give us any, um, tips and tactics on kind of home dental care. This is a subject that really fascinates me personally, and I know there's really not enough information out there right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I tell people, you know, is if you um, go to the dentist, you know, twice a year to get your teeth cleaned and checked to, uh, and, and get x-rays to make sure you don't have, you know, some, some uh, occult decay going on somewhere in your teeth, and you brush and floss two times a day, you can eat candy, you can eat cake, you can drink soda, you can go wild. And um, as long as you do those things, those three things, then um, you, know, you, you insulate yourself from most dental issues fairly well. But therein lies the problem. You know, so many people, uh, you know, there's about, uh, uh, I think the statistic I read the other day was about 130 million Americans don't have dental insurance. I'm sure after this nightmare is over, it'll be even more. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so a lot of people don't get routine dental care. And the only time they go to the dentist is when they're having, you know, some type of emergency. And that's usually precipitated by pain. So pain is the biggest motivator that gets people into the dentist office these days. And you mentioned about pain. Um, can you give us, besides pain, maybe some signs and symptoms to look for in ourselves if we are um, starting to develop an infection in one of our teeth? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, the signs of, uh, you know, infection and inflammation in, in the mouth is the same as it is everywhere else in the body. You know, it's basically redness, swelling, pain, pus, or fever, mm -hmm. uh, and then loss of function. So, you know, 
if you wake up one day and your eyes swollen shut and you know you got pus in your mouth and you can't open your jaw then you know the chances that you have uh an infection somewhere in your mouth you know usually in a in a tooth uh, a back tooth is is pretty good and now the only intervention from there would be antibiotics if i'm correct um, well, antibiotics are limited in that. You know, you have to have kind of a surgical solution to get on the other side of that. Antibiotics are just going to, um, most of the time, once an infection reaches that point where it manifests like physical symptoms, aside from, you know, just localized issues, like just, and when I say localized, I mean just in the, in the one tooth, um, then um, antibiotics aren't going to be of any use. Hmm. Now we see the, the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks and he's got the pain. Yeah. And he takes the rock and knocks it out. Would that be kind of something that last ditch effort somebody could do? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, using a, a rock and a, and an ice skate, you know, is probably, um, you know, I guess if you have to use what you have, but I mean, there's, there's better ways to do it. And I, I have yet to meet somebody that has successfully pulled their own tooth. Huh. Um, I see a lot of people that will, you know, they'll come into the office, their chief complaint is, you know, like I had a tooth that was bugging me a couple of weeks ago. So I took out a pair of pliers and I took it out, but now it's still bothering me and now I'm swollen up and I don't know, I think it injured my gums or something. And then we'll x-ray it and, you know, the whole root of the tooth is in there. Um, and, you know, they didn't get it out. People just think that the part that they see in their mouth when they smile in the mirror is their tooth. And it's, it's not, it's not like a baby tooth, you know, a baby tooth. Um, when you take out your kid's baby tooth, you know, the roots on that tooth have been resorbed. If you take out a kid's baby tooth before it's ready to go, it has a full, full root on it, just like an adult tooth does. Baby teeth are engineered in a way that's different than adult teeth and that, you know, adult teeth do not resorb um, like baby teeth do under normal conditions. Um, there are some disease states that will cause that to happen, but it's not a usual thing. So people will grab a hold of it with a plier and twist it off or break it off and then think, oh, problem solved. And it, you know, you, it's, it's just literally the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole uh, hunk of that underneath the gum tissue that you can't see that's buried in the bone. And if you don't get that part out, you're going to, you, you've actually gone from bad to worse. Mm. Now, how long would it take for someone to kind of get up to speed and be able to do simple, simple, like first responder type procedures at home on another family member. Uh, you know, how, how, how many hours of training do you think it would take for somebody to kind of get a minimal basic level of understanding about this stuff? Uh, well, they have a thing in um, certain rural states like in Alaska and maybe a few of the um, central states where um, dental professionals are, you know, in a big shortage, like a health professional shortage area. And they have this thing called a, a dental mid-level practitioner, which is kind of like the dentist version of a PA okay, um, or a nurse practitioner. And they can do like a limited number of procedures. And I believe that's a two-year oh. um, program. So it's two years in addition to um, what they already have. A lot of those people are, are dental hygienists. Um, that do that. So that's four years plus another two. So that's six. Um, so yeah, quite a bit. It's it's a bit more involved just because you know you're essentially doing surgery on somebody's head. Yeah. Um, and if you screw that up, it it's not a, a difficult um, route for infection to make the the three you know three inches of uh, of uh, travel necessary to get into the brain or the six inches of travel necessary to get into the heart. So it's one of those things that uh, you, you really have to be sure footed on what you're doing. Otherwise you can really screw somebody up. Yeah. So basically what you're saying about this stuff is uh, if you are ever in the situation where you can't get to the dentist or whatever, you know, you gotta at least consult your dentist. You can't just take this on John Wayne and um, try to fix it your damn self. No, I mean, you know, outside the United States, um, and especially like in third world countries, like people dying of dental ailments is, is still probably in the top 10 causes of death. Hmm. Um, it happens regularly, you know, before in the pre antibiotic age, um, you know, the average lifespan was, you know, 30, 35 years old. 
And a lot of those people succumb to uh, illnesses derived from dental issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, um, as soon as, as soon as things turn from first world into third world conditions, then it becomes a, a real worry. You know, I always tell people in these classes, the best thing that you can do is, is, uh, you know, befriend a dentist, um, or, or, you know, if you, if you find yourself in a survival commune or something, you know, be nice to, to one of them so that they'll, uh, you know, either come be your doctor or, you know, at least set up some kind of barter system with them or something so that yeah. you can, uh, kind of stay in their good graces because it's, it, it's impossible for me to impart to people, um, you know, um, basically like decades worth of, of, yeah. of, of experience and, and education and training, um, in, uh, if in a two or a four hour course, you know, when you guys do run these courses, it is a two to four hour course. And, um, you discuss the very basics and give guys the tools that they will need to go ahead or, you know, the, the knowledge rather that they will need to go ahead and, um, kind of have an awareness of this stuff and maybe be able to do like a very basic procedure, but nothing, nothing too crazy. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, it's nothing really invasive. You know, the, the, the biggest thing I teach is like how to uh, replace a lost filling um, or put a temporary filling into a tooth. And I mean, when I say temporary, I mean, you know, temporary stuff lasts, um, you know, it's temporary. Some people, you can put it in them and it'll stay there for six months. Some people, you can put it in and it'll stay there until they make it to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other thing I show people is like how to uh, temporarily reattach a lost crown or bridge um, just because that can cause you know a lot of sensitivity and um, decreased function and ability to eat and drink and things like that yeah and I've got actually one of those home dental kits it's not even a dental mm -hmm. kit it's uh, one of those little packages about yay big it's like I don't know made by Saul or something like that what do mm -hmm. you think about those uh, those little kits that people can get yeah they're fine as long as they have like a temporary filling material of some sort in them and then um, like clove oil is really um, useful as a, a dental analgesic for pain. Um, you know, if you have sensitivity in a tooth, you can put some clove oil on it, and that'll usually uh, shut it down at least temporarily. It's outstanding, outstanding information. Um, and you, I mean, as well as talking about the emergency dental care, you talk about, you know, um, trauma and patching guys up, TCCC, which for everyone else out there who doesn't know or may not know is um, – Am I correct in saying tactical combat casualty care? That's correct. And um, so this is something that's really big. And um, I like to tell guys and girls too that, hey, listen, you know, you need to be able to stabilize somebody to get them to that higher level of care. Uh, but yep. it, it sounds like you go a lot more in depth than your kind of standard TCCC. Being a doctor, you're able to go a little bit more in depth. How do you like to go about teaching your courses on that? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that I go like more in depth or anything. And I don't really even think about it as, as far as, um, stabilizing people, you know, I mean, you know, before I, I did this kind of stuff, you know, I actually worked, um, full time as a, as a firefighter EMT and I did that for about 10 years. And, um, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of times you have patients and, and you're not really stabilizing them. All you're doing is just kind of holding them over long enough to get them off to somebody else. And, um, you know, sometimes once you get them to the medics, even they will, um, get that person uh, or that patient, uh, shipped off, you know, via helicopter to a trauma center. Um, instead of, you know, a lot of the places where I worked, we had like level four, um, you know, remote hospitals that are kind of out in the sticks and, a lot of times if we had patients that were uh, significantly injured or ill to the point where it couldn't be managed um, in the level four, you know, we would send them to the only level one trauma center uh, in that area, which was Harborview Hospital in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, so once they go there, then, you know, then they can do the whole thing. But, you know, a lot of the stuff I talk about in classes, um, my class is a little bit different in that um, a lot of the tactical medical medical classes and stuff are, are kind of off-putting to people that are outside of the tactical community. You know, it's nothing, 
um, for you or I to just say like, Hey man, like let's um, grab our, you know, our ARs and our plate carriers and let's go, you know, do this 2000 round class. Like, you know, wouldn't bat an eye at something like that. But, you know, a lot of times the people that I'm teaching these classes to are like kindergarten teachers and church groups and sometimes even church security groups. And a lot of church security groups aren't nearly as, you know, switched on and, and you know, uh, preparedness mindset based as, as we'd like them to be. So this class that I teach is actually, um, you know, the reason I don't call it um, TCCC is because it's actually a little bit um, more simplified so that, you know, any lay person can, can get something out of it and, and understand what, you know, what, what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And um, I've had about 26 successes so far, um, you know, people that have taken the class The uh, I don't know, probably, I've been teaching a version of that class. You know, first I taught it for um, tactical response for James Yeager, you know, as his medical program director from uh, 06 to uh, 2012. And then I started teaching on my own. So, you know, in that time I've taught a few thousand people. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've actually had people use it on their way home from the class. So that's, uh, you know, it's always nice to hear back those, those stories and, and how that works out for people. So, but I mean, all the stuff is the same, you know, tourniquet application is the same. Um, you know, there's only one right way to do that. Uh, wound packing, same thing. Um, pressure bandage application, same thing, chest seal application, same thing. So, um, you know, there's, there's only really one right, right way to do it, but there are certain conditions that must be met before you can do it. And that's what the class is basically made up of. We kind of see all the tats cool guys, regardless of if they have a lot of training or not running around with uh, tourniquets on their plate carriers or somewhere on their kit. Sure. And, uh, you know, I like to say for myself, I hope that they all have some kind of training, but you don't know who does and who doesn't. Now, how important is it if you have a cat tourniquet or whatever kind of TQ you have on your kit, how important is it that you actually take an actual course and actually learn all of the actual stuff you're supposed to? Uh, I mean, I think it's important. You know, I see a lot of people that don't um, have, you know, proper training on them and, and the thing that is – there's a lot of pieces that they're missing like right away. So, you know, if you're wearing armor, then you need to have the ability to treat extremities, you know, because if you take rounds or you take fragments or you take some kind of pointy object that's going to uh, pierce your body, you know, if you have a plate carrier or something on it's, it's uh, or armor uh, or a helmet, it's, it's, you know, most likely not going to be in your chest or in your head. Um, However, there's kind of a flip side to that, you know, that doesn't carry over to, you know, regular folks that are just out like living their life, you know, um, a tourniquet is only part of the equation. So there's been, you know, numerous um, journals and, and scientific articles written about, um, you know, looking specifically at um, life threatening extremity injuries in like active shooter cases. And the numbers are really, really low. You know, most of those people are shot either in somewhere in the thorax or somewhere in the head. And um, a tourniquet does nothing for those things, you know. So just walking around, you know, with your, I, you know, I see like pictures on Instagram of people's, you know, this is my pocket dump or my EDC carry stuff, you know, and it's like, you know, a gun, a knife and um, some ammo and a tourniquet. And it's like, I mean, you know, unless you're running around in a, in a, you know, uh, with, with some kind of chest armor and a, and a helmet on, then that's probably only part of what you need, you know, and, and I don't understand why, because chest seals, you know, you can get high fin pocket chest seals now that are like literally not much bigger than like a visa card. And you can carry a pair of them in your back pocket something that is, is literally like less than a quarter of an inch, you know, probably not even that, probably like, you know, three eighths of an inch thick. Um, and, um, and just flat, you know, tiny, maybe not even that thick. I mean, they're thin, they're, they're thin enough that you could carry them in your pocket and forget that they're there. And, um, 
you know, if somebody did that, that would increase their capability, you know, tremendously. Now you have something that you can actually um, treat, you know, three different kinds of injuries with. You can treat extremity injuries. You can treat injuries, uh, uh, piercing injuries that occur between the Adam's apple and the belly button. And if you just added like some type of, of combat gauze or packable gauze, you know, you could treat junctional injuries. So um, those three things, you know, in a pinch are really, really hard to improvise. So if you already have purpose built materials on you, that's like, you know, more than half the battle. And I do want to interject doctor that um, I think, you know, training would be also a really important part of that whole thing. As far as your kit goes, you know, people talk about, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this, but then they don't have the training to go with it, to look at it and say, yeah, this might be a tension pneumo or whatever. Um, yeah. so for guys to be able to come and if you're in the Tennessee area, get to your course. I know next time it's running, I'm going to try to get down myself, but you know, I, I really think that that's just such an overlooked thing is actually paying your money that you earn to go and like earn some of these skill sets to put in your repertoire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I mean, you know, it, even, um, as simple as, um, um, you know, if someone shot in the chest, uh, and they have a bullet hole in the front of their chest and, you know, maybe a, an exit wound on the backside. If you put chest seals on those, you don't need to know whether or not they're having a tension pneumothorax or not. Like, you know, the, the treatment's going to be the same because as soon as they get to uh, a place where they can get a chest x-ray and a chest tube, that's what they're getting. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, you know, you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't lose anything from putting, you know, chest seals on people. And really, I mean, when you, kind of get down to it, you don't really lose anything from putting a tourniquet on somebody either. You know, the, the medics could always get there and go, oh, you know, this controlled with direct pressure, we can go ahead and discontinue this tourniquet. Or when they get to the emergency room, they're going to take it off anyway, uh, more likely than not, or at least they'll loosen it and then go, holy smokes, like, like you know, we need to get this guy to, to surgery right away, or this thing looks like it's kind of clamped down. Um, and, you know, we have a little more time to, to work, but, um, you know, very few of these interventions are, um, are, uh, you know, an either or type of affair, you know, they're, they're something that's beneficial. And, you know, the, the, the downside is, is if you don't do those things, that person might die. If you do those things, um, that, you know, very, very best, uh, you're going to, you're going to help them. And at the very worst, they probably didn't do anything at all, you know, like that they had something else going on. So none of these things uh, that we, that I teach are, um, are uh, negative or, or, or damaging, you know? So if it's a quote unquote non-invasive procedure, go ahead and do it. I mean, you, you know, depending, I mean, you know, depending on what it is, then, sure, then sure. yeah. Yeah. Solid information. Um, I want to circle back around. You were a firefighter for 10 years. Um, did you love it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I started out as a police cadet when I was 15. And, um, and then when I got to be a little bit older, one of my buddies um, that uh, was also a cadet, you know, he ended up going the firefighter route. And he was like, man, I, you know, this is in the 90s. He was like, man, I make like 27 bucks an hour. And I was like, 27 bucks an hour? Like, what? And um, so... Um, I kind of, you know, switched over to that side for a while and then, um, did that through school and then, um, got kind of heavily into, uh, specialized security and security contracting stuff and then did, um, and then got back into law enforcement a few years ago. And, um, and so, yeah, my first degree was actually in law enforcement too. So, um, did you, um, did you get overseas in your career at all or? No, no, it was all just here, and um, it was all either doing um, um, either uh, Federal Reserve um, hmm. type security or um, transportation type security for currency, gold, um, bonds, and, you know, other valuables like that. Oh, that's pretty cool, huh? Now, I want to get into this whole COVID-19 with you. Being a medical professional, I think that you have a unique um, viewpoint on this for us. Now, I've talked with, I can't tell you how many guys uh, over the past couple of weeks who are really not, you know, not suspecting this is so serious. Um, 
Just your personal opinion before we go any further. What, what are we looking at here, doctor? Uh, I mean, I think it's accurate to say that um, what makes this virus unique is that it has a, um, it has a, a, you know, viruses are non-living. Um, some people call them organisms and some people make the argument they're, that they're not an organism because they only consist of essentially a armored capsule and then the genetic material that's inside of them that they um, turn uh, a living cell into their um, production factory to make more viruses. So this virus is unique in that it has um, a lipid envelope that surrounds it. And most viruses, a lot of viruses don't have that. And what that means is that, you know, it's lipid. So it's made out of fat, you know, fat, you, you know, using a, a fat as a barrier kind of has a few um, inherent uh, flaws in that it's uh, easily damaged by things like heat, ultraviolet light, um, sometimes humidity, you know, things that you could, you kind of think in your head, like if I took um, a block of butter, like what can I do to it to, to, you know, get through that butter? Like you can cook it, you know, you can heat the heck out of it. Um, you know, you can, uh, Expose it to ultraviolet light, it'll melt, you know, again, because kind of same sort of idea about heat. Basically, the thing is, is, is heat or ultraviolet uh, radiation will damage it. So the problem is, is that it allows this virus to be much more contagious than other viruses that normally inhabit uh, humans. And so I think there is a definite um, concern as far as how it's going to affect people that are either elderly or immunocompromised. But I think once we have um, antibody testing for the general population, um, I think that we're going to see that far more people actually have been either silent um, carriers of this virus uh, at some point and are now immune or well, and now have antibodies um, to it um, or that, um, far more people got it, never even knew that they, I mean, they never manifested symptoms as being sick. And so I think that once that testing is available, people are going to be like, holy smokes, man. There's a lot more people that had this thing than we thought. Hmm. Now you mentioned that this, uh, this thing is surrounded by uh, fat cells, basically. And you are mentioning that that's uh, sensitive to heat. And I know um, I'm a big fan of the Joe Rogan show, and he talks about infrared saunas and saunas in general, heat being very good for the person, be, for people. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say? I mean, is that kind of medically accurate to say that maybe going and getting your body core temperature or temperature up would be very productive at this point? I mean, you know, possibly. It's, it's all kind of hypothetical at this point, but – you know, if we mimic the processes by which our body um, actually uses to fight, uh, you know, viral invaders with, you know, uh, development of fever is one of those things. You know, that's directed by um, a series of physiologic processes in our body whereby, like, our um, hypothalamus increases our, uh, um, our body temperature, you know, uh, automatically in response to a viral or, you know, invader. And the reason it does that is because, you know, a lot of viruses don't work well in high temperatures, but our uh, metabolic processes inside of our own bodies tend to work a little bit better sometimes at higher temperatures. Not for a sustained amount of time, but, you know, um, in, in limited doses, we can kind of sort of be like a race car in the red, I guess you could say. And and it helps um, counter some things. So, yeah, I mean, you know, as far as saunas and hot yoga and, you know, things like this, I think that we'll probably see in the future that there will be um, more people that are doing those kinds of things once those facilities are back open just because, um, you know, it, and in addition to that, you know, like the things that Joe Rogan always talks about is like the um, increased um, uh, heat shock proteins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you, uh, as you do those things and you become more um, accustomed to the heat, you know, our body makes 
small adaptations um, to be able to deal with that kind of thing. And if you look at, at the outbreak uh, or the epidemic and scales of numbers, when you look at the um, patient populations that deal or, or, or that have um, like saunas as, as part of their um, culture, you know, like a lot of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, things like this, um, those, um, the numbers there are fairly low, you know. I mean, of course, their population density is less, but, I mean, if you look at it in, in terms of scale, it's probably a little bit less than, than the average. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, of uh, hypotheticals right now that sound like they may pan out to be something useful in the future, but I think until more time ticks by, we're just not really going to know for sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And I wanted to ask you also, speaking about heat, you know, we look at Nevada, Arizona, I've actually been kind of keeping track of um, what's going on out in Palestine and the Middle East a bit, um, as far as this thing goes. It doesn't look like it's really crazy out that way. Um, could that potentially be because of the dry and the hot environment? Yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and you know, if you look at, um, even though it's a different kind of virus, if you look at the um, Spanish flu, you know, epidemic back in, you know, 1918, um, a lot of times they set up these outdoor, you know, tented type sanitarium type, you know, host field hospitals essentially to treat those people. And when they actually got into the warmer months, you know, when the sun was out, a lot of those patients just by being, you know, having increased sun exposure, um, you know, benefited a great deal from those too. So, yeah, I mean, there could definitely be some, some weight to that idea. And, um, and, you know, is it because of the UV itself, like possibly, is it because it's, um, you know, UV is required by humans to, um, uh, you know, complete some metabolic processes. It could be that too. You know, I mean, there's, there's a number of, of variables in play there that we're not really quite probably uh, have, you know, everybody's trying to drill down on this thing as hard as they can. So a lot of people that were formerly focused um, on different parts of research now have kind of probably changed their focus to, you know, com combating this thing directly instead of trying to figure out, um, you know, backdoor and kind of Hail Mary options on this. Mm -hmm. Now, you bring up the UV light and everything, and um, this is something we've been trying to experiment with on the fire department is getting our uh, masks, being able to reuse them because we're running really low at this point. Um, for guys yeah. out there who want to be able to have an option to reuse their masks, I mean, putting it out in the sunlight for a few hours, would that be a viable option for us, or, or what would you recommend as far as reusing PPE? Um, I've heard a couple things from people that I trust. Um, one of them, Dr. James Hildreth, he's actually um, the uh, professor of Meharry Medical College here in Nashville, um, where I work um, and where I went to school. And um, he recommends that if you have PPE that doesn't have metal or staples in it, um, that you can um, put it in like a, a like a Ziploc bag and then put it in the uh, microwave for like three minutes oh. and that amount of, you know, microwave radiation will kill anything um, that's in there. Oh. Oh, oh, well, you know, in a virus, it, you, you, I guess you can't really say you kill a virus, you know, you inactivate it. Inactivate. Um, and then um, another thing I read said that like, um, like let's say, you know, you're, um, if, if you're a firefighter, you would have like, uh, nine bags like nine plastic bags with with an n95 in each one of those nine bags and so you write like one two three four five six seven eight nine and you know today is the start of your shift week you um, are going to wear mask number one today so and then let's say you know i don't know how you work but i i used to work two on five off so i'd wear mask one today um and then i put it back in the bag and then I'd wear a mask two tomorrow and then I'd put it back in the bag. And then, you know, now I have like, um, five days off. So five days later, then I'm going to come in and I'm going to wear these other ones. So basically what the idea is, is that you have a nine day supply of masks and not doing anything to those masks, you know, just keeping them in a, in a bag 
um, for nine days will inactivate anything that's in there. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, but you know, the, the problem is, is, and you know, this like from working on the rigs and stuff is if you leave anything that is, you know, has latex or, um, even nitrile rubber, you know, to a lot of UV light exposure, it cracks and it falls apart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the, the box of gloves that you keep like in the center console of the rig, you know, and, you know, when you're 30 seconds out from your, uh, from the call, you put on a pair of gloves before you get out of the rig, you know, if those are sitting there for a long time, or if they're even sitting there for, well, not even that long of the time, you know, you're going to eventually put one on and your fingers are going to go right through the end of it just because, um, those, that type of material has, um, volatile bromide, or volatile, uh, halides in it. So things like, like, um, bromine, chlorine, things like that, gases, you know, that are made, uh, or that are used in the construction of those products. And when they're exposed to ultraviolet light, that stuff becomes volatile and it comes off, which, you know, puts a breach in the material. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, as cool as it would be to have like some UV microwave oven kind of type thing that you could drop these into. And I know that they do have some things like that. I don't think it's going to be a, uh, an indefinite kind of thing. You know how those masks are, man. Like, you know, you put those things on sometime, especially if you get, you know, if it's some, uh, great big huge person that you got to move or you know there's a bunch of stairs involved or something like that you get sweating or you know it's a, a hotter environment and you're just you know breathing a lot through that thing they get like moist yeah and, and you know when they're moist they um are subject to increase in per increased permeability so you know more stuff can come through when they're wet than it can when it's dry so um you know i think that that's also going to be sort of a factor in how much mileage we're going to get out of one of those things, you know? And until we come up with, um, uh, something that, um, has the sealing capability of an N95, you know, that's been fit tested to your face with, uh, like maybe, you know, a, a harness that has that same type of sealing capability, but you can change out the filters in them then I think we're really going to be limited. But I wouldn't expect it's going to be too long before that type of thing is available. And, you know, we could always go back to, like, when I, when, you know, when I was doing stuff on the rigs in the 90s, we didn't have N95s the way they look now. You know, we had, like, NIOSH-type um, masks, you know, that had two canisters on them and a rubber harness, you know, is essentially like a gas mask without a face shield. Um, and, you know, we wore those on TV patients and, and um, all other kinds of crap. And so um, those would also be, you know, an acceptable kind of thing because, you know, you can change the filters on those really easily. And then the harness itself, you know, you can use um, cavicide or whatever type of, of virucidal, bactericidal wipes you have to, you know, kind of douche those things down after you put them back in service and they'll continue to function um, to talk. This is another thing I wanted to ask you about is deconning your equipment. Um, not necessarily mm -hmm. for, you know, professionals, however, for civilians as well. Is there, you know, an option you can kind of talk about with us? I know Lysol, you can't get it anymore. Things like that. Um, I've been using 70, 70% 70 rubbing alcohol. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, I mean, the, I would still kind of err on the side of, you know, anything that you can wash in your washer, um, in your clothes washer, you know, like wash it with detergent, um, and, um, and put it on a long cycle. And, um, I think that that'll kill probably, you know, most things. This virus doesn't, you know, because it has that lipid, um, component in the coat, you know, if you, you remember those, you're maybe not quite old enough to remember this, but there used to be like these Dawn dish detergent commercials where they show like a casserole dish. And it would have a whole bunch of grease baked onto it. And then they would squirt it down with some Dawn. And then they would like hold it up to the light. And it would say like actual time elapsed, you know, three minutes. Oh, right, yeah. And you'd see, you'd see the grease run down it. So, you know, soap of any kind is, is going to be soluble um, in lipids. So if you expose soap to any type of lipid, it's going to break it down. Hmm. Um, and, and that's how it works. So any type of... Um, exposure that you can have will inactivate the viral particles. So when I was still 
um, working, you know, even though I wear like full PPE when I'm seeing patients, um, I would, uh, you know, come home um, in through the entryway that takes me right by the laundry room. And I would just, you know, doff all my clothes and boots and equipment and everything and just throw it all in there. So, you know, of course you can't wash like, um, you know, metal stuff and things like this, but, but, um, everything else you can. And, and I think that, um, um, I don't know how it is where you are, but like bleach wipes are still pretty, um, available, you know, like Clorox type wipes. And, um, I bought, uh, like two packs of those at Costco, like when, before this all happened, just in, in anticipation, anticipation of it. And, you know, we use them every day to like wipe down, you know, common surfaces and stuff. And, um, and we've still got, you know, a bunch of them. So I use those, those two, if I had to wipe down something that I couldn't actually put in the wash. That's a good call. Um, so I'm right outside of New York city and, um, mm -hmm. don't give out my exact location just for OPSEC, but I do sure. notice here that you can't get anything anymore. I mean, it, there's no wives, there's no nothing. It's just, we got to improvise at this point. Um, so really what I want to ask you is this is, circling back around to these N95s and for those guys and girls at home that, you know, don't have for whatever reason, any access to N95s. Um, how about the K N95s from China? Do you have any? <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, I don't have any firsthand experience with those, but like the people that I look to for that kind of stuff, I think that, um, you know, like so many other things that we manufacture in America that China has like scrupulously copied um, it's probably, they're probably legit, but I'm a little, you know, also kind of leery on, um, on, uh, taking China's word really on anything right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it might, may be a good possibility. I see that a lot of online vendors and stuff are carrying them now, you know, you know like taxable places, even, um, you can buy them, you know, singly or buy like a 10 pack and things like that. And, um, you know, time will tell, I mean, as far as using it for like first line PPE, like for a healthcare provider, like that's different than, than, you know, um, um, just your average Joe or, or Jolene that's, you know, go wearing something like that to go to the grocery store. Um, for things like that, I think you could probably go even, you know, a little bit lighter, um, because it's going to be, uh, um, you know, you're not directly in somebody's face and secretions and everything else like that. So, um, you know, as, as much as I hate to say it, like, you know, wearing even just like a bandana and, and really doing strict social distancing stuff. And, and I think that probably six feet is, uh, I'm not sure why they did that. I probably just did that for like store logistics because I've seen studies that say that like the droplets can actually travel um, you know, like, uh, like seven, eight meters, you know? So, um, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I think that there's, there's definitely going to be like a trade off between being as safe as you can be and, in um, being as safe as practically allowable, I guess, yeah. you know, so, you know, if I go to the grocery store and there's already like 40 people in there, I can't just like scream at people that, you know, come within eight yards of me. I mean, I'd get kicked out of the store pretty quick. Um, but that doesn't mean I haven't thought about, <laughs> about doing that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you really want to play it safe, I'd say just Instacart everything and, um, and you know, don't, don't leave the house and, yeah. and uh, yeah. I was, um, so. I was joking with my buddy today about, uh, the Chinese, you know, first they send us this virus, then they freaking rip us off on these, uh, KN95 masks. They're charging like two fifty per mask when it costs like, I don't know, probably less than 50 cents over there to make. What oh, is yeah. your opinion on, um, the virus? I mean, do you think that this could have been something made in a lab? Yeah, I do. And, and I think that just because, I mean, I don't really have any like hard concrete proof or anything, but I just think it's highly circumstantial that, you know, there's um, a bio weapons laboratory um, in, um, in the Wuhan uh, 
you know, area there in China. Um, and that this kind of thing, uh, you, you know, like, like viruses that have been similar to this, like the MERS virus and the SARS-2, um, or SARS virus, you know, in years past, I mean, in the last 10 years, you know, are also coronaviruses that are very similar, um, are also studied at that place. So, yeah, I mean, what are like the geo, you know, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to go figure out and, and think about because you almost have to like strap on your tinfoil hat, you know, and, and get real crazy and think like, you know, who's to benefit from, um, you know, China destroying the, the, you know, geopolitical and economic systems of so many other countries in the United States, or, sorry, the, other than the United States, in addition to the United States. Um, I don't know. I don't know where the play is there, but um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible that it, that it could be something that's engineered. It, it, I, I find it really, really weird to think that it would be something that was in a bat um, because a, a bat isn't really considered like a consumable. I mean, you know, even in China, like, I think that it's weird that, that I don't know, I, I can't, I can't think of a, a of an episode um, of, uh, <laughs> of Anthony Bourdain where he was eating bats, you know, um, not to say people don't do it. I'm sure that there are weirdos out there that'll eat anything, but, uh, y you know, it's, that really seems like a low probability event to me. I don't know. I was, in, uh, I was in China two years ago and I never saw that on the menu, but I don't read Chinese. So, um, yeah, I had a guy kilo 23 group on, and he was mentioning to me that he has a friend who's uh, some kind of analyst with the CIA. And this analyst mm -hmm. was telling him that if you can get reinfected by a virus, that <clears throat> there's a good, good chance that it could be engineered. Have you ever heard anything mm -hmm. to that degree? I haven't heard anything like that, but I mean, like, um, Scientifically, you know, it, it, it makes sense. I think the difference would have to be, you know, you still can't change the, the rules of physics. So if, um, you know, humans have a thing, a, a division of our immune system, you know, called acquired immunity. And that's kind of what everybody's talking about as far as the formation of antibodies against specific antigens. So, you know, with a virus, the antigen can be... Um, any component of the virus. So like I said earlier, you know, viruses aren't alive. So it's not like it's a cell that has a, you know, uh, like a bacterial cell that, you know, that has specific components and organelles in it and things. This is just, you know, a, a coat or an envelope. And then there's a thing called a capsid, you know, which is essentially like the, the capsule that goes around the virus. And then, um, there are some other components that kind of go into its structure. And then there is the genetic, or, I mean, the, uh, the um, in this case, RNA component inside of that. Um, that's the transmissible information. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have that virus and you acquire immunity to it um, through antibody formation, then for that virus, that same virus to be able to reinfect you, something has to be different. So either the genetic information contained therein has to be different, the, um, the viral coat has to be different, or the capsid and uh, components of the virus itself have to be different. Because if those antibodies, you know, they work like a lock and a key. So they're super specific and they'll only fit in those certain receptor sites that are found on the surfaces of these particles. So if those um, particles are the same, then it's still gonna work. So, you know, if there is the capability, and I'm not sure, I haven't really heard the science on whether or not like that's a for sure thing or not, um, you know, then I would wonder if there was like, um, perhaps like, uh, almost like there's regional dialects of a language Mm. That there might be, you know, regional strains of um, of a, a coronavirus, right. and and I mean, you know, there are regional strains of the flu virus. So you know, like what you guys might get up north, 
might be different than what we get down here in the South, which might also be different from both of us than what you get up in say, um, uh, like Washington state, you know, it, it, they can be that different. Like they, do they manifest the same? Yeah. But like on a genetics and genomic um, type of scale, they're different. You know, that makes complete sense. Uh, this past winter, I got a bad flu um, and I recovered and immediately left for the Middle East. And when I was in Jordan, I got the same bad flu right over again. And I was wondering yeah. how the hell is this possible? But I guess like yeah. you said, regional. Yeah. And, and, you know, just because the symptoms and um, manifest the same way. It doesn't mean that it's not a different, that the genomics aren't different, you know? Um, just because, you know, there's only so many ways that like a flu um, can manifest in a person. You know, there's only certain signs or symptoms that are gonna pop up. So it's just like, you know, with any other pre-hospital care stuff, you know, you know, like you go to somewhere, you assess the patient, and then you ascertain that, According to your education, training, and experience, the signs and symptoms, you know, the signs that you see, the symptoms that this patient reports, lead you to believe that this person is suffering from this. So based on their history, based on your exam, and then based on your findings, you figure out that, that you know, this patient's either got this, this, or this going on. You know, whatever it is, we're taking them to the hospital. Same kind of thing. So, you know, um, those signs or symptoms of a flu, you know, I mean, general malaise, you know, uh, coughing, you know, runny nose, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, all these things are, are just such a broad uh, spectrum of symptoms, but they can be caused by literally probably thousands of different, mm. um, thousands of different uh, viruses, but the manifestations all the same. It just depends on the severity and how much damage it actually does to the body. You know, and, th and a lot of that has to do with how fast the virus replicates. Um, and the faster it replicates, the more dangerous it is because the faster it replicates, remember that every time it replicates and it, it fills up a cell, you know, a hijacked cell with these new viral particles, those viral particles have to escape that cell by breaking that cell. So when that cell breaks, it's, it's, combat ineffective it's no longer doing its job and if you have that happen to enough cells that make up uh an organ you know uh, you know the cells make are are, are uh, make up tissues and the tissues make up organs then you end up having you know irreparable organ damage so those kinds of things um are are, are kind of what you look at and then that doesn't even take into a fact it, it take into account the fact that a lot of these viruses, you know, have different um, um, rates of infection to the point where how they get spread, you know. So the, the concern about this one and, and what the United States and most state governments are trying to do is get it down to where one person is only infecting one other person. That was the whole point, in, you know, behind all the social distancing and restricting um, people's movement and behavior was we don't want to expose, you know, have one person exposing 10 people because I don't know if you read about one of the cases in China. I want to say it was um, patient like, th th this may be wrong, but I think it was like patient number 49 or something um, belonged to like, this sounds like something out of science fiction, but they belong to some type of religious cult and they surmised that that one patient infected something like 10,000 people. Wow. Um, so, you know, the crazy thing is, is if you have a virus that is really, really super virulent, meaning that like it, it kills really quick, it would, we would never hear about it because, you know, a person would get it, they'd manifest symptoms and die within four hours. I mean, you know, you and I've worked in the pre-hospital field to know like, there's plenty of times where people's mail stacks up or someone hasn't heard from Miss Johnson in a couple of days. And, you know, you go there and you pop the door or you kick it in or whatever. And that person's been dead there for, you know, a, a period of time. Um, if this thing kills people, you know, if there was a virus that killed people in four hours, nobody would ever get it because it, it'd be over and done with before anybody even knew what happened. 
the thing that, that is scary about this one is like I said, with the, you know, with the antibody testing that we'll be able to do here in the near future is that, you know, we might all be having, we could all have this thing. And if we have any kind of patient care contact, I'm sure that like most healthcare providers have probably had this and probably had it for months and not even known, you know, so if you're, if you're healthy and you can mount a good, you know, immune system response to it, it may not even been a blip on the radar for, for some people. Now, doctor, we are seeing people right now that are young and healthy, um, passing away from this virus. What, what do you make of this? It's, it's hard to say. And, and, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, I think that as time goes on and we're able to study this thing closer, we'll see that like the viral load has a lot to do with it. So, you know, if, if you are, um, uh, continually exposed to, um, th there's, I don't know quite how to, uh, say this, but like, so if, if you just get like one, um, lung full of, of viral particles, say, okay. Um, you know, maybe you get sick, maybe you don't, maybe you manifest symptoms, maybe you don't, but let's imagine that like you work in an area where there's somebody who has it, you know, they're, um, hacking this stuff off all day long and you're just huffing it up. So not, you don't get just one lung full, you get like days of lung fulls. Now you're, your cells have become so saturated with viral particles that, like I said before, you know, you, you end up with organ damage that can't, that's not reversible. And I think that that's probably what's happened with a lot of those people. So, you know, young people, um, you know, like college students getting it and things like this, you know, that I've seen, if you think about it, like, you know, you're in a dorm, a dormitory with, you know, 400 other kids and you're, in a place that has central air and cooling and you know, there's four to six HVAC units that are on um, the roof that service that whole building and everything's getting rebreathed through a system of duct work that's in the ceiling. So before you know it, like that air, um, everybody's breathed at some point uh -huh. and you know, so there's that. So yeah, I mean, um, and, and it's it's hard to say, you know. They're they're and they're very very may well be like a complete genetic component to this, where some people are just susceptible to this far more than anybody else, and there might be some people that are not at all. So, what would your advice be to people right now? I mean, we've seen people protesting, we've seen people getting all upset. What do you say to all of that, man? Well, I think that the, the science shows that, like, while we are making progress with this, I don't think that we have flattened the curve, as everybody has said, you know, is, is commonly saying. I think that we're, like, working towards that, but we're still not to the point where we're there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, you know, the concern is, is let's say we open America back up, you know, May 1st. Um, and then, you know, the next weekend, everybody's, you know, standing around, like, scratching their heads about, oh, man, do you remember when we shut down the country because of coronavirus? Boy, that was ridiculous, wasn't it? Yeah. And, you know, everybody goes back to their normal ways of life. And then two weeks later, um, we have a resurgence that would be an order of magnitude greater than anything we've had thus far. And if that happens, then, um, you know, health systems are going to be completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And, and there isn't going to be a thing to do about it. So um, I think that like doing this cautiously, I mean, you know, this has affected, you know, I, my work just as much as, as, as uh, anybody's. I mean, I got laid off from the practice that I was at, um, you know, as soon as this thing happened. So yeah, it's, um, I, I mean, I, I would much rather like slow walk this back to, um, you know, reactivating the economy and getting everything else going. Um, you know, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and, uh, this is like the, um, bridesmaid party capital of the United States now, even more so than New Orleans and Las Vegas. And I mean, I'll tell you, as soon as they open up the economy to allow that kind of stuff again, there's going to be, you know, herds of these gals, you know, drinking white claws and, uh, wearing fake cowboy hats, dancing in the streets, packing all over each other and, 
it's going to be right back to it. And yeah, I mean, it sucks, you know, for, for the loss of the economy and stuff, but I mean, really, um, you know, it's going to, it, it could very well become a problem that would be insurmountable um, and worse than, than what it is now if we don't continue to monitor this thing super, super closely and really not jump into things prematurely until there is an absolutely positive national downward trend. Yeah. Because, you know, if you think about it, like, like you know, if, if things, things are improving in New York, but they're not to the point where they're awesome, and, and, you know, like, I know that um, a lot of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers hospitals and stuff that they've stood up there, you know, haven't necessarily needed to be used for overflow in the hospital ship. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that that's with New York essentially shut down. Uh-huh. So it, as soon as we turn everything back on and there's still, you know, people that are, you know, a thousand people a day, say, that are coming in to the hospitals that are still positive. If they run, you know, if New York starts back up again, then um, before long, you know, a thousand cases a day is going to be a lot more than a thousand cases a day, and the system's going to be overwhelmed. So, um, and I think that that goes for just about everywhere. You know, all the places that that have had like major outbreaks, like LA and Seattle and stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're kind of like it, it looked like we were making progress here in Tennessee, and then over the weekend there was a huge influx of cases just in Davidson County here in Nashville alone. Uh, so um, while the state is still on track to open up, I think on April 30th, uh, Nashville itself is not going to be part of that just because um, of the risk involved. You know, we, um, we hear a lot of guys talking about this is a conspiracy. They're going to lock us down because of the new world order and everything. Look, I'm a liberty or death loving guy, man. Like I will, you know, take a bullet for this country any day. But I think a lot of those people are outside of the areas and also outside of the medical professional field in general. They don't understand this thing. Um, you know, for a doctor like yourself, for a guy like me, I'm living here and I see it firsthand. I've got friends, you know, really messed up. People are dying left and right. Guys, it's not, it's not whatever you think it's it might be. It's, it's not. Yeah. And people are dying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, that this is all a conspiracy, you know, that at some point everybody's going to come, you know, the ATF is going to come for everybody's guns, you know, that there's, you know, some secret black site right now where, you know, the, uh, a million ATF agents are putting on, you know, balaclavas and, and, and black body armor and stuff to get it ready to do this invasion of America and take everybody's guns man, it's, it's a bunch of crap. You know, there's, there's like less than 2,200 ATF agents in the entire country. So what are they going to do? Like they, they, they've got more things to worry about and that's, you know, doing what they normally do, which is get criminals with guns off of the streets. So, um, yeah, there's all kinds of, you know, like when people come up with all these conspiracy theories, you know, being somebody who, um, has worked in a, in a leadership position, you know, in, in businesses and companies before, I think like, do, do people realize like how much manpower is involved with that kind of stuff? I mean, it's a tremendous amount, you know, like, like think about how many, you know, secretaries you have at the fire department, you know, to manage the paperwork for the chief, the assistant chief and the lieutenants, you know, and, and the captain. So like, you know, when you think about like that, and then you think, what would it take to run, you know, this massive psychological slash intelligence operation slash um, uh, direct action, you know, mobilization to be able to do all this stuff to all these people? Uh, you know, there'd be a lot less people unemployed if that was the case, because everybody would have a damn job working for the government doing something to contribute to the conspiracy effort. I don't so, think that people should get lax because there is a good potential that we will start to see uh, some type of breakdown in society. And I don't think that the government is going to try to attack us in any way, but I think that no. we should be aware that a breakdown in society is a potential. So, you know, look, keep your damn guns close to you, um, but it, you don't want to keep them close to you because of the, you know, space alien zombies getting you. You want to keep them close to you because civil unrest could be a potential. 
Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that um, that's the thing that I worry about the most, you know, with this is like, yeah, the virus is a concern, certainly. But the thing that I am most concerned about is um, people's um, overzealous response to this, you know, and, and just, you know, the, the, there's, there's, there's just a tremendous amount of ignorance in the world and, and it's not going to get any better when these kinds of things are going on and there's this uh, global pandemic happening, you know, it's kind of like when you say, you know, like um, (laughs) when, when you're, um, you know, whether you're like around somebody that's having an anxiety attack or they're freaking out, you know, after a car accident or whatever, and you're, you know, there's somebody that's always yelling at them, calm down, Susan, (laughs) calm down. You know, it's like never in the history of calming down has yelling calm down made anybody calm down. You know, the same thing applies to this situation. You know, if, if, if things get real sideways and, and there starts to be civil unrest, no amount of telling people, hey, 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 like, it's not that bad, man. You know, you can always get groceries at the Piggly Wiggly kind of thing. Then people aren't, aren't going to respond to that kind of thing. Because once people get locked into that mode of wanting to be in mob violence, the only thing they're going to feel like doing is some mob violence. Yeah. And, um, And if you are um, one of the people that is armed and on the fringe of that thing, like lay low and let the police do their job. Um, What the police's job is going to be at that point, it's hard to say. You know, I mean, um, while we prepare for those kinds of things, there's also, you know, part of the, um, the, you know, there's kind of a risk benefit analysis that goes into things like that. You know, there's a lot of, police departments around the country right now that aren't really in an enforcement mode because we don't have the capabilities to incarcerate anybody, even for a short amount of time, um, even for violent offenses. You know, a lot of um, correctional facilities have shut down completely just because they don't want to be responsible um, or have their staff exposed to, uh, you know, people that are, uh, that have the coronavirus. So, you know, it's, it's a real slippery slope. And, and um, I think that uh, once things get crazy, you know, it's going to be um, nothing good is going to come out of it. It's going to be really worrisome. And like, I mean, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that like I have guns and stuff, but I mean, really people are thinking that they're going to need to you know, do like a a Rick Grimes, like walking dead, like stand up a neighborhood army kind of thing. But really all the same situations that apply to us on a daily basis are going to be the concern. It's just going to be a higher frequency of them happening. I'm talking about things, you know, like, like rape, robbery, carjackings, things like this, you know, um, and, uh, it's not going to be, you know, a, a citizen's militia, um, direct action mission, you know, to, to, uh, resecure the grocery store. Huh. It's, that's just, that's just not a, not a realistic, um, kind of thing. I don't think in this world. Yeah. And, you know, I want to interject here is that things will go back to normal at some point. So if you catch someone, you know, breaking in your car and you shoot them in the back of the head, don't think for a second that eventually that won't be prosecuted, you know? Um, oh yeah. 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 Yeah, just because there's no grand juries happening right now and, and, you know, most courts are shut down and stuff, it doesn't mean they're going to start back up. You know, it, it, it's, yeah, man. I mean, it's, I, I could see, like, a lot of people, you know, treating it like it's some kind of purge free-for-all, but, but it's not. You know, this is, this is ultimately, this isn't a third-world country, you know, and even if this stuff happens and, and things get bad for a while, you're exactly right. Once, once the dust settles we're all going to be back to a first world country. And, you know, if you want to dance a jig, you're going to have to pay the fiddler at some point. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, all that stuff is going to uh, stick around. So, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's not, you you know, the uh, rules of engagement, if you will, or, you know, the the laws of self-defense don't change in a, in a a pandemic. It just becomes, um, you know, the, the frequency in which they're required maybe increases slightly. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to circle back around to a little bit lighter of a topic here before we start to close sure. out. And uh, that's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
So mm -hmm. you and I were talking before we went live about um, jujitsu, and you said, yeah, March 18th, things shut down out there. I think that's nationwide. Um, how do you think guys can be kind of like keeping their fitness up a little bit at home uh, to get back on the mat at some point? And the second half of that question I have for you is, you know, do you have kind of a time frame that you personally are looking at before we can start going back to things like jujitsu with close personal contact? Yeah, I mean, I think as soon as, like I said, once we've, you know, really seen a historical decline in the number of cases to the point where, um, to the point where cases are low enough where an order of magnitude increase is not going to overwhelm our health system, then I think that that's probably the point, you know, or that's the point at which things are going to go back to being um, normal and by normal I mean like not like the way they were before but whatever this new kind of post pandemic normal is going to be for us and um, yeah I think um, I mean you know as far as the jiu-jitsu community you know most of the people that are in the jiu-jitsu community are, are pretty darn healthy um, and even the folks that are you know over age 60 are probably the healthiest over age 60 people around. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, what, I mean, you know, I'm just a white belt. I don't know shit about shit for when it comes to jujitsu, you know, I mean, I know like four really good moves, um, uh, and a couple escapes and, um, but you know, the thing I'm doing is just like working on, you know, cardio fitness and just trying to eat as clean as I can and stay as healthy as possible. So that, um, you know, once things open up, I can get back there and start training without having to regress too much. And, um, and, and that's, that's just what I'm shooting for. I'm lucky in that, you know, I have a 14 year old son who also trains with me. So, um, of course, you know, he's six feet tall and 150 pounds. So he doesn't like having his six foot four, you know, 270 pound dad squishing him in side control. So, uh, I can only get him to drill with me sometimes because, you know, uh, there's a, a mismatch in, in dimension there. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you can do that kind of stuff, do that. If not, just like, you know, I think working on um, flexibility and and cardio is is an important thing. And there's so many people that are, like, producing cool videos. You know, like, like Bernardo Faria and John Danaher have, like, put out that solo um, – drill video that they offered for free, you know, and, and, and professor Bernardo has been giving away tutorials and stuff. A lot of schools, uh, my Academy, you know, they set up a, a private account, uh, a private access account, you know, that had solo drills and then also things you can work on. Um, so yeah, I think that the jujitsu community itself has done a tremendous amount of stuff. And, you know, like Henzo Gracie's offered his Academy, um, virtual Academy online for free you know, during the course of the pandemic for people to be able to use for, for training and technique and stuff. And I think just watching videos, I mean, I'm like a really visual learner, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do like surgically and stuff, you know, I've refined through watching other people do it on videos and I'm really good at, at, at taking that kind of stuff and copying it. And so, you know, I watch uh, a ton of videos much to the chagrin of my wife who um, does not have the interest in it that I have. But yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, studying videos and stuff is, is really invaluable, especially at times like this where that's all you got, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, the other thing I was thinking about the other day, I read an article and it said like, um, uh, well, you know, like a lot of people like tend to copy the move set of whoever it is that they kind of like idolize yeah. or they, they, uh, identify with as far as like size and stuff, you know, like when I first started, I think within two weeks of starting, I got, um, Bernardo Faria's, um, pressure passing and, um, deep half guard stuff. And then, um, I got, uh, professor Bernardo, uh, Calvaro's, um, passing for chubby guys, which was, um, kind of a funny title, but it was just like basically like squishing people to pass them. Um, if you're like, you know, if you have enough mass to be able to do it and, um, and you know, that's what I kind of like started doing those and, and had success with those techniques and just kept on like, you know, using them and refining them. Um, 
but I was reading a thing the other day and it said like, don't just take that kind of stuff because, you know, that's what you identify with or that that's um, who you idolize, you know, like use techniques from people and try them out, you know, that you wouldn't normally think to try out. You know, if, if you're, if you're not a tall lanky guy with long legs that can like throw triangles and omoplatas from anywhere, you know, um, and you don't normally put that into your game, like try putting that into your game and just see what that looks like. Because even from a conditioning perspective, if you can pull that stuff off, it's, it's still going to improve your game and everything else. Yeah. And um, I think that that's, that's pretty wise piece of advice. Now I want to ask you one last medical question here. Um, you mentioned the cardio and, we mm-hmm. see guys out there walking around, or even running, biking with masks on. How mm-hmm. important do you think it is to wear a mask outside? Uh, I personally, like, when I go hike, I go to a place that's, like, relatively remote. And, and, you know, maybe in the span of two hours and seven miles, I'll see, like, maybe a dozen people. Mm-hmm. But the path is, you know, it's a two-lane road. So they're actually, like, on the other side of the of the road, you know, like, you know, what is that? I mean, how long is it, or how wide is a road? You know, it's like what, 20 some feet, 22 yeah. feet or whatever. So, you know, they're like seven, eight yards away um, when we pass, you know? And so um, I see people out there wearing masks, not, not like, you know, N95 respirators or anything like that, but just like bandana or, you know, those spandex, um, like uh, heat, ma- you know, like the motorcycle type masks. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't really like see much point in it. When I'm in the neighborhood that I live in and there's a whole bunch of people, you know, that are out like walking their dogs and stuff like that, then maybe, you know, because you can trail viral particles. Like, you know, if I was say like six feet behind you, like in line with you and the wind is blowing in your face. I mean, obviously the, if you're off gassing viral particles, it's going to hit me. Um, that's why that, you know, there's some of those, <laughs> these, these, exercise websites that are saying like stagger, you know, so like basically be uh, like 45 degrees, you know, opposed to you. Uh, um, yeah. Or, well, or I guess if you lengthen it, it would be 30, you know, as you go further out. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that there's, there's kind of a, um, you know, point of diminishing returns there, you know, as you know, like wearing one of those respirators and like having to do any kind of strenuous activity is like less than fun. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's one of those kind of things, one of those, I don't know if those masks have enough resistance on inhalation that it's going to like increase your VO2 max. If you do those kinds of things on a regular basis, it might, um, but it definitely doesn't um, make the time go by any quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, companies like Peloton and stuff like that, you know, that have home exercise equipment, I'm sure that that those businesses are just killing the game right now because, you know, like if if you didn't have to leave your house to work out other than like you get claustrophobic or, you know, you get not claustrophobic, um, you know, cabin fever, you know, I mean, why would you leave your house to work out if you could just hop on your, on your Peloton bike or hop on your Peloton treadmill and just, you know, knock out, you know, you know, you know, when you look at those things, you always think like, who the hell has time to do like a two hour workout? <laughs> well, there's plenty of people that have time to do a two hour workout now, you know, and um, I've spent more time during this, you know, uh, layoff working out than I, you know, um, at a time, you know, at, at a continuous duration than I have in, in, I don't even know how long. I mean, it's, maybe even forever. Um, you know, there used to be times like before this, when I would do like two a day kind of stuff, like catch a hit class and then go do jujitsu or catch a yoga class and go do jujitsu or something like that. Um, but you know, it'd be like literally 12 hours apart, you know, one at five o'clock in the morning and one at six o'clock at night. Um, but now it's like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> get up and, you know, just, mill around I just I'm I'm not built for that kind of stuff so now how important is it um to think about overtraining and not overtraining um I think you know the the other good thing about right now especially for people you know like us that do jujitsu is you know if you do jujitsu I think um 
And this doesn't apply just to jujitsu. I think this applies to like any kind of contact sport. Like before I did jujitsu, I did uh, rugby. I played rugby. I played for Gonzaga University. And then I played on some club teams after I graduated. And, you know, if you play a sport where you are playing regularly and you're conditioning and training regularly, you know, you always have like either like a nagging injury or like you're kind of like right at the edge of an injury to the point where it's like, you know, you have some type of like, minor like for lack of a better term like disability like temporary you know even if it's just like you know my knee's clicky or my knee is stiff or something like that or you know um that's the other good thing i think about this time is that like everybody can like fully heal up and and a lot of that i think is attributed to how much rest people get Uh so you know during the week i mean i would like to be able to sleep like eight hours a night but a lot of times my schedule dictates the point where I can only I sleep like five or six. And I know that that goes into, you know, that factors into my recovery as far as athleticism. Um, and then also healing injuries. So, you know, like I popped a rib like maybe two months ago, um, like when I got beat up by this D1 wrestler. And, um, and you know, that was a miserable injury. And I talked to uh, one of my buddies, Paul Sharp, from shiv works, you know, I said, Hey man, like pop the rib, you know, on my, um, you know, it's probably like T12 or so, um, you know, on my right side, T10, T12, somewhere in there, uh, you know, on my right flank, like, what should I do? And he's like, don't get on bottom, like stay on top <laughs> the whole time. And, and if you're in close, if you end up in, in uh, closed guard, like still be in the top position, like, and get that guy's legs off of you so he's not pushing on your rib. And I was like, okay. And so, like, that's what I did because I didn't want to stop training. And, you know, like, you need your, your ribs, and it's, it's really hard to do much of anything if, you're, if your ribs are hurting. And, um, and so I just kind of continued to press on through it. I, you know, did a Guy Mendez seminar with a broken rib, um, uh, challenged one of his black belts, Jonathan Alves to sparring, you know, and of course that didn't go well for me, but I mean, I still showed up and, um, and, um, and, you know, got promoted too. So, um, uh, strike promotion. So, uh, yeah, I think that the cool thing about this is like, everybody's going to come back like better than they were before just because we're all healed up now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good and, and everybody's sleeping good. Exactly. Is, you know, I mean, I feel like all the jujitsu heads out there, you know, I, I've had a lot of guys, purple belts, brown belts, black belts, just fucking bitching endlessly about, oh, I could not myself. I've never not trained. But at the end of the day, they're going to come back, you know, 80% healed as much as you can at that point. It'd be good yeah. for all of us, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good thing. And, you know, a lot of people have made, like, big changes to their diet because, like, mm-hmm. you know, right now, like, I, I mean, I eat clean probably, like, 80% of the time and then 20% of the time I, I like, while out, you know? Yeah. And, um, but it's a lot, it's been a lot easier to eat clean much more consistently because, you know, as much as I'd love to, like, go to the Mongolian grill and get, like, a, you know, a big bowl of rice and chicken and pineapple, like, that's not on the menu right now. Like, I can't. It's yeah. not, it's not, not doable. And so, you know, about the only places that like when I want to have a, a cheat meal, you know, that are available readily around here is like sushi places. And, you know, you could do a lot worse for cheat meals as far as sushi goes. I mean, about the worst thing in that is the sodium, you yeah. know, that makes you retain a little bit more water. Um, but that stuff is transient, you know, that'll, that'll disappear after, you know, some cardio and, and some water. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good thing. Um, it, it's not a good thing. It's as good as can be given the circumstances. Yeah, I like the example. I was watching Lee Morrison of UC Combatives, and he was uh, mm-hmm. saying that you got to view it like going and doing a jail bid. You know, but the good thing about that is for guys that come out of prison, usually they come out more fit and more, like, lean and everything. And you got to really, yeah. I think, thinking about it like that. Like, we're in a jail bid right now, but work out bulk up, you know, eat clean as you can, come out of it healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that anybody that comes out of this that hasn't like done something to better themselves, like wasted time and, and you know, whether, whatever that is. So like, I mean, just an example, like, um, 
you know, I took Spanish like when I was in high school and in college and, and I've worked in places where Spanish was the primary language. So I had to speak it, but I never got to the point where I thought that I was like really awesome outside of the medical field. You know, I could do, you know, uh, um, you know, H and P with, um, you know, in Spanish, but, but, you know, as far as like doing conversational Spanish, I couldn't do it. So I, I, you know, got an app and I've been doing probably like 90 minutes a day of Spanish, um, during this thing. I think I've done like about 94 hours of Spanish so far. Um, so yeah, that, and then, um, actually bought a bow staff and, nice. uh, <laughs> I've been fiddling around with that cause that's kind of a solitary activity anyway. And, yeah. and kind of mindless and, and it's just something that, um, one night, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching jujitsu videos and you know, at the, when you're watching YouTube at the last 10 seconds of the video, like some other, you know, YouTube algorithm suggestion will pop up mm-hmm. as far as, you know, what you should watch next. Yeah. It, it came up with a bow staff tutorial. <laughs> now, somehow that got linked to a jujitsu video and I was like, huh, okay. So I watched it and I was like, well, this looks like actually kind of cool. And, um, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, by the end of this thing, I'm hoping to be like a, a conversationally fluent Spanish Ninja Turtle. Hell yeah, man. Dude, that sounds like <laughs> what's up, dude. Um, yeah. Wise man. Wise man. And I got to be honest with you, man. I, um, I haven't even crossed off half the things on the list that we want to talk about. I want to talk about. YouTube. Sure. So um, I'm going to cut it here so we don't like overwhelm the YouTube channel. But um, okay. Would you mind coming back on maybe to do a part two at some point? Sure, I'd love to. That'd be outstanding. Yeah, well, man. Awesome. Dr. House, I appreciate you so much coming on. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Guys, until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. Take that seriously. Don't mess around right now. Do not take any more risks than you need to. And I will hit you on the next Tactical Podcast. Please stand by for part two of the Tactical Podcast with Dr. House.